Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and Watches Tonight. Folks, this evening we're discussing why silver watches, that is precious metal silver watches, are uncommon. You give me a question about cars and I answer that question, and after the off-topic excursion, we discuss the most worthwhile watch tech available right now. All this, and I'm sharing your viewer wrist shots. Folks, there is no better place than the watchbox.com, another one of my web properties within my web empire, especially when you want to sell. We pay cash, we pay fast, we make it a no-brainer, and of course, with 2,500 pre-owned and vintage watches online right now, if you want to trade or buy, we give you great options. Along those lines, a new direct purchase and pricing inquiry email line. This is tmasso at thewatchbox.com for your questions about any watch you see on my Watchbox Reviews channel or thewatchbox.com. Let's jump in and see a few of yours. Remember, you can join me on Instagram, Tim underscore Masso, all video reviews posting daily. I also post the newest stuff, so you might see it there first. I can see Mr. Blue Shirt Buddha joining us from Long Island. We've got Long Mac, Mr. No Date, Thomas Burnett, Edward M, The Watch Lounge, Grim Beebe from Denmark. Thank you for joining in from Europe. Stand up late with us. We've got Matt Foster and we have Eric Meds joining in. Everyone, thanks so much. Andrew, Philip M, Chris Gross, welcome Simon Holt. Guys, I see a lot of our regulars and a few new names. A warm welcome to all. Let's see some of your watches. You sent these to me. As I like to say, your pieces on my pixels, starting with Russell K, opening our account with a little bit of a quasi loom shot of his sensational 2019 20th anniversary Alanga Unzona Datagraph Lumen. Bruce L of Long Island, or I should say Long Island Long Beach, right there in that photo, a local blue shirt Buddha. Showcasing his polar white Rolex Explorer 242, that would be my choice as well. Randy A takes a winter ride with his Triumph. And Alpha Hand Pre Moon Speedmaster. Gotta love that straight bar bracelet, by the way. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watches on my box. We got one more, Ben S. This is Ben S and his white ceramic dial, SMP Diver 300 meter, and US Marshals badge in the background. Going after the fugitives and protecting our federal judges. Very cool. Remember, wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com if you wish to see those pieces of yours on these pixels right here, or as I like to say, your analog on my digital. We've got Randy Allen, Avi B, Victor. We've got Emily N joining in. Emily, welcome, welcome back. I think I saw her name for the first time last week. We've got Magister Stevenson, welcome. And we've got a guy named Snook. We've got Attilio E. We've got Huxley, Turkish Meister, joining us from the great nation of Turkey. We've got OCM506, Dave Oppenkar, and Marco Juan Olmos, Flippin' Zippo. And we have Kunik from Germany. Welcome, guys. Watch once over. What's good, Tim? Everything is good here on Watches tonight. Let's jump into one of your questions. You've got a question from me, James T. I don't know who you are, but you ask me, where are the silver watches? Watches. Why only gold and platinum? This is a great question because there was a time when silver watches were quite common, and that time was the 19th century. Or more precisely, it was the entire era of the pocket watch, as silver in various grades was once considered to be the economical, anti-corrosive choice. And in the era of pocket watches, before the availability of high-quality stainless steels, silver made a lot of sense. People generally weren't going to buy super cheap watches. Iron was unsuitable because it would corrode, and gold was expensive. So usually, if you were going to buy a watch in the old days, the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, you were probably going to have enough money to buy a decent watch. And that's why silver was considered entry-level. Now, it fell out of favor in the 1920s and 30s with the arrival of Firth Brown's Stay Bright Stainless Steel. So stainless steel, and you can see an example, an early example in 1930s Zenith, Stay Bright was not designed for wristwatch applications. It was designed for things like uh, medical environments or cafeteria environments or utensils. And wrist oils actually tended to corrode the early stainless steels. And nevertheless, it did slot in and replace silver in the era of the wristwatch. And by 1938, wristwatches were outselling pocket watches and steel was now plentiful and cheap. The budget-minded rust resistance of silver, in other words, was displaced by the even cheaper stainless steel. Now today, silver remains in use, but only as a novelty or for the purposes 
sources of nostalgia. So let me explain. In the 70s and 80s, the newly entry-level Cartier products marketed under Le Mousse de Cartier, the Mousse de Cartier brand, oftentimes used silver. And there were examples of Cartier watches that were silver in its basic state, usually sterling 925, or you would have silver that was then coated with gold for a more upscale look. But in both cases, the idea was to lower the price point for a precious metal Cartier. Uh, Jorn, F.P. Jorn, for 2013, the 30th anniversary of the completion of his first watch, he launched the T10 in platinum, but perhaps more intriguingly, the T30, 99 pieces in rose gold and sterling silver. Now, this watch featured exquisite guilloche on the case flank, which was of sterling, as well as the case back, which had a lovely ricochet-style rose lathe pattern. And again, all of the silver on this case is real silver, which means it has a little bit of a tendency to tarnish. Folks ask, isn't silver inert? Silver is inert. It should not be corroding. But sterling silver, which is the most commonly used grade on watches, especially today when middle-grade silver is unheard of, uh, it does have 6% copper content, which is why you have that periodic tarnish. I'll also mention, and the opposite end of the watchmaking spectrum and market spectrum, U-Boat has created a couple of its Classico chronograph and standard models in sterling silver. Also, Duby and Schildebrand, which is kind of a smaller, revived brand, uh, they have created examples, particularly of their Diplomat, the, uh, the Carré model, the Carré Diplomat. That has been executed in sterling with a couple of different dial options, of which I find that one to be the most handsome. So that was the Carré Cambrai Diplomat by Duby and Schildebrand, and then, of course, Ox und Junior, which is the independent brand of one-time Ulysse Norden, celestial complication maestro Ludwig Oxlin and his son, hence Ox und Junior. They will make any number of watches in their catalog out of sterling, and they will make them up to 47 millimeters in diameter if you wish. This watch, intriguingly, was built custom as a perpetual calendar, everything external is in silver, including the patina dial. So that's right, that brown dial is a highly patinaed version of sterling that's been turned brown. And all of the indications on the dial, under the dial, the actual wheels that display the calendar, those too have been executed in patina silver. But as you can see, these are all uncommon watches. Boutique brands, limited editions, outright customs. Most recently, Zenith, last year, with the Pilot Type 20 Extra Special, 45 millimeters featuring an elite caliber. It was a 250-piece limited edition Zenith Pilot Type 20 that had a fascinating Ford Trimotor-inspired rivet form dial. It wasn't an actual riveted dial, but it had that look to it inside a true sterling silver case. I thought 250 was kind of a lot as these things go. Nevertheless, the sterling silver watch remains, albeit on seemingly perpetual life support. Jumping into the box right here, I see we have Emily N joining from Halifax, Canada. We've got all manner of friends and the Angry Plumber, the newest among them. We've got Rio So joining from, looks like British Columbia. And then we have the Watch Lounge. We've got Chris Gross, we've got Crappy Larry and Jack. And then we have bump, 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 all sorts of comments saying that the Zenith Pilot Type 20 is stunning in person. That's from Chris Gross. I, I agree with you. I saw it at Watches and Wonders last year. It was very cool. Most of the effect though comes from the dial, not the silver case, which looks like, well, let's be honest, steel. <laughs> So you can also see one of the reasons we don't see too much silver today. It's indistinctly precious. Now let's talk about one more reason why you won't see silver watches. Sterling in particular tends to turn some wrists blue. Maybe that's the real reason you don't see it in wristwatches. <laughs> okay, jumping back into the box, I can see we've got lots of friends right here. John from the UK. Jack, thank you so much. We've got JVM joining from my old haunt of Hollywood, Florida. And then we've got Long Mac asking, Tim, can you get an Alonga Unzona for 18,000? Absolutely you can. Generally, you're gonna be looking at older Saxonia models. So look at 90 Saxonias and you're gonna find there's probably no shortage of options. Your money will go farther if you're happy with yellow gold. Okay, we've got Roar of the Tiger. Good evening. I own Art Deco Rolex prints in sterling silver. That's a fact. Many of the prints models made between 1928 and approximately 1942 were offered at the entry level in sterling silver. That was when Staybright was just taken off. And we've got Tillman Zurich calling. 
the largest city in Switzerland is on board. Marcel B asks, Tim, you mention cars on the show all the time and show the watches and wheels wrist shots, but what cars do you like specifically? I'm reluctant to give this too much standalone time because we all know what happens when a YouTube channel or publication focusing on watches or cars goes off topic. Is anyone actually watching Matt Farah's podcasts? No. So I'm not going to focus on this. I'm just going to briefly give you an overview. My choice for a classic collectible to keep forever would be a 1966 Oldsmobile Toronado. The rolling revolution of 1966 and the first front-wheel drive large American car since the Cord 810 and 812 of the pre-war era. If you look at the grille, you can even see a little bit of the cord intentionally placed there by the designers. That's a car I could fix with my bike tools forever. Modern cars will go in the trash. And just to give Matt Farah some credit, because I tore him down a second ago, he did say that the test Tesla Model 3 performance felt like the first truly disposable car. That may be true. This will still be running on its 100th birthday. Now, as a pure driver's car, admittedly, a 19-foot-long Oldsmobile doesn't qualify. So give me a Consulier GTP, the company that later became better known as Mosler Automotive and today makes the, Ro the Roycean cars out of West Palm Beach. But Back in the 80s, that was probably the track weapon. And if one of those things ever pops up for sale, I might have to pop up and claim it. Or, moving forward to the 90s, another independent American brand, Panos, and the AIV Aluminum Intensive Roadster. That was actually the first design project by Freeman Thomas before he would go on to fame and fortune with BMW and later Chrysler. For daily use, again, I can name my ticket, uh, give me a Karma Rivero, which is the domesticated and non-combustible version of the Fisker Karma that I briefly owned. No, not briefly for that reason. Simply because I saw the writing on the wall, an unserviceable car with a million problems and complicated electronics. That's it in the old watch you want parking lot. It was brief but blissful. So the Rivero is, as I said, the domesticated version of that car that's been to finishing school and critically was actually designed by engineers. So there you have it. And here's the Chevy Volt that I currently drive just for good measure with the Bill Holland Exagrid Thai carbon road bike frame that I use to get my thrills while I await my next high performance machine. They don't come any more exciting than a road bike. On one inch tires, Every road is 100 miles an hour. Chat, guys, let me know some of your favorite cars as we cruise along right here. We've got Laurent saying Panos, big fan. Dave Opencar, 1966 Toronado, a tank in the winter. That's a fact. The front wheel drive gets it done. And the Toronado 425 engine under the hood with almost 400 horsepower and 500 pound-feet of torque. It was a beast in its day. It could chew the tail feathers of a high-performance Jaguar sedan. We got Aaron Murphy joining from Missouri. And we got NS something saying, my dad had an 80s Tornado. It got stolen in front of our house. Nobody missed it. Well, that's the difference between the 60s and the 80s. And then we've got right here Edward Ledden asking, what do you think of Doug DeMuro? I actually like the guy. I think he realizes that you've got to stick with a format and go deep into it and, and be dedicated to it. Rather than trying to expand into lifestyle products and irrelevant tangents and wondering, you know, whether we care what he thinks about politics or the world at large, he sticks to his very narrowly focused and detailed car reviews, and I love that. I also love the fact that he actually reviewed the Vector W8, and I have a theory why some of the parts in the car were unfinished. I think he reviewed the prototype of the W8, and that's why some of the stuff in there was not installed. But the fact that he reviewed my dream car from circa 15 years old infinitely endears me to that guy. And he used to be local to Philly. Okay, right here we got Outlaw Santa out of my Toyota Hybrid. I had one of those. I had a Prius once. Juan almost 918 Spider is his dream. Nick 4 UK, Caterham R500. The Watch Lounge mentioning Jay Leno has a killer Toronado. I think his may have been suitably upgraded, but you're absolutely right. And then a question from UWU asking, how easily scratched damaged is a Rolex? Any watch, if dropped, will be damaged badly. The shock is something that few watches tolerate well, and in any case, you're like to shatter the sapphire and dent the case. How hard is it to scratch? Not terribly hard. Any steel is likely to scratch. The good thing about Rolex is 
most of the most popular models or tool watches, so you can get away with a few scuffs. But if you have a problem with scratches and scuffs, I've got a recommendation for you later in the show. Nick Rice is saying 66 GTO in our garage. Crappy Larry, somewhat apocryphal claim that he likes the Ford Pinto. Emily N saying, I will take that 60s Jaguar. Alexi Samola of Finland saying the Karma still looks good. Alexi, the Karma was built by Valmet Automotive in Finland. Takes one to know one. And then, question from Jack, does Tim have cyclist quads? I'm more of a high-end engine type guy. I'm not a sprinter. I'm, I'm that guy who will kill you up a mountain or lay down a scalding pace for an hour at the front of the pace line. I'm not the guy who wins the town line sprints, though I got a decent sprint. I don't look like Andre Greipel. I look more like, eh, who's big and tall? A little bit more like Chris Froome. Take, take away the hair, and, and I would be Chris Froome. That's the one thing I got on him. He's a better rider, but I have better hair. And then right here, bump, 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 We've got Bud Owens saying, if we're talking car grails, give me a 73 911 Carrera RS. Ooh, good one. A 250 Lusso Ferrari and a 288 GTO. Okay, jumping in right here, BNS asking, Tim, do you think some other material would be more popularly used in watches than stainless steel in the future? I think in the future, we're likely to see a lot more hardened steels. I, I think there's really no downside to using face hardened steels for most applications. I think tool steel is a little bit much and tungsten carbide like, like Rado is a bit much, but I do think you'll be seeing more steels that have a hardened surface like Zinn or ice hardening like Damasco, because at the end of the day, when a watch company takes watches back for service, refinishing is a huge waste of time that they would rather skip to get the watches back more quickly and avoid a long queue for the few people they have at the companies who do that work. So I would, Bud Owen saying, you're a climber, I like crits. I'll be the guy who leads you out in the crit. I will break all the guys behind us. I will give you the privilege of the final launch. I'll be your last man. And uh, right here, Roar of the Tiger. I'm a big fan of any Pagani, but I would love to build a mini Marcos. Yeah, you and me both. That's pretty neat. The Heritage Group in the UK keeping them alive. And then we've got Boyan joining us from Lausanne. Very cool. Okay, so jumping back into our regularly scheduled program, uh, viewer wrist shots, watches you sent to me for your viewing pleasure reflected right back at you. The man in the mirror. I'm bringing up James T. celebrating the Lunar New Year with his new to him 1996 Rolex Explorer 2. Jeb Brooks, who I should mention is a travel YouTuber. You might want to check Jeb Brooks Flies. Sharon is 2019 Rolex GMT Master White Gold Meteorite Dial Pepsi in our nation's capital. Very cool. Chris L continues our occasional loom shot theme with his Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean Caliber 8500. Larry A shares a very neat, nicely composed his and hers Patek Calatrava Pilot with a 5524G, that's the his, and the Singapore Special 400 piece a limited edition stainless steel 7234A. Very, very cool. I love the dial on the 7234A. Heck, I love both of those dials. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Main feature the most worthwhile watch tech we have right now. Real quickly, I'm going to read a few more of your comments. We've got Edward Ledden saying, Alexi, hello, I thought the people of Finland loved McLaren because of Mika Hakkinen. That said, the more recent Flying Finn won his championship with Ferrari. So if you're talking about Kimi, you have many brands from which to choose because it seems like he's driven for half of the grid at this point. And then right here, we have Jack saying, I have a 2017 GMT Master II BLNR. And then Russell996 commenting, nice Pepsi. Russell has some nice watches, so that is high praise. And then right here we have Jack saying it just ordered another Bremont, a U2 Jet Black. Congrats. Send me a wrist shot when that one lands. Dave Opencar saying Damasco DS80 compares to a Zin EZM 1.1. That's right. The Damasco is also thinner has no date, and is a little bit smaller as a case. Plus, the Damasco straps are water resistant, which is super rare, and the bracelet is a work of art. So if you're considering one of these used, I would say definitely consider the Damasco 
DS80. It's real cool and you can get it in neon green and you guys know how I feel about that. All right, jumping back into our regularly scheduled program, the most worthwhile watch tech right now. Not the most advanced, not necessarily even the most innovative or most expensive, but the stuff that I felt is most relevant to collectors. Now I'm gonna end with a minute repeater, so maybe I throw that notion out the window at the end, but these are tech advances that I think have made a difference when wearing the watch on your wrist. Stuff you can tell. So, while the torrent of watch technology patents never abate, certain innovations are simply more relevant to collectors on daily utility, aesthetic refinement, or absolute precision. And here's a discussion of my favorites and how they benefit collectors. In the interest of full disclosure, I will also discuss the weaknesses of some of these technologies. And we're going to start with Seiko Spring Drive. This was a concept first conceived by Yoshikasu Akahane, who died in 1998, unfortunately did not see the first Spring Drive watch launched in 1999. But it took from 1977 and his first idea to 1999 to make this happen, and there's a reason. It's really hard to do. The idea being to take essentially a system, by the way, that black dial watch was the first of the Spring Drive Seikos. Try to find one of those, it's a collector's item. Let's go full screen if we can here. It's a system that hybridizes quartz and mechanical. What you don't see in that picture is a battery, a capacitor, or a motor. All of the energy is spring potential energy being converted into kinetic and electric energy. Inducted, well, I, I should say basically a induced current by virtue of the mainspring's drive turns a unidirectional governing wheel that produces the smooth sweep of the seconds hand characteristic of spring drive. Now because the induced current wakes up the quartz oscillator, a back EMF generated by the governing wheel provides a certain amount of back pressure to govern the rate. If it's running too slow, it will speed up because the back EMF will be reduced. Electromagnetic force, that's the EMF. If it is running too fast, the EMF will increase, which will slow it down. This regulation allows these spring drive calibers to achieve precision of up to plus or minus 10 seconds per month. Again, without a battery, a capacitor, or a motor. All of the action is by the mainspring. All of the motion is mechanical. It is a lifetime serviceable system designed to last not just the lifetime of the watch, but the lifetime of the owner. Decades of research, innumerable patents, and again, that distinctive smooth sweep of a hand with no step stutters or stops. At the end of the day, it's delivered from Seiko price points in the hundreds of dollars, right up to Crador level, where you will see finishing techniques. If we can go full screen right there, you can see the image of the native bell flower that has been cut into the spring barrel. Take a look at the size of the chamfers on the barrel, yes, but also on the bridges and in every jewel and screw sink. This is finish on the Philippe Dufour level, and you know this because they went over and consulted him before they started building these movements. That is the 7R14A, a spring drive caliber in the Crador family that you will find in the H2 model. Weaknesses, well, unfortunately, the weakness of this system lies in you and me. There is market resistance at the luxury level to any kind of quartz, even a brilliant hybrid quartz system. And that's why you rarely see any Swiss brands attempting to follow, and for the most part, after 21 years, Grand Seiko and Seiko still have the field to themselves, with one exception. That is the 2016 108-piece limited edition white gold cushion case Piaget Emperador Cousin XL, the 700P caliber, uh, designed to celebrate 40 years since the original Quartz Piaget in-house movement. This is basically Swiss spring drive. The problem, it costs over $70,000. They made very few of them, and then they stopped. All of which is to say spring drive is extraordinary, but until luxury buyers get used to the idea that Quartz can equal luxury, it will always struggle to win converts outside the fraternity of Seiko and Grand Seiko fans and to spread to other brands and other watchmaking nations. Right now, we have all sorts of love for spring drive. Russell 996, amazing tech. Chris Gross saying, I love my spring drive. And then right here, we have Emily Ensa and would love to own a spring drive someday. Currently have a 36,000 vibration per hour vintage high beat Grand Seiko in the collection. We've got Kuma saying good morning from Japan, home of Grand Seiko. Good to catch you live, Tim. Kuma, thank you for getting up early with us. And then right here, bump, 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 we have 
Adrian Burke saying, it is wonderful, it'd be wonderful to have a Crator. <sighs> you don't have to convince me, you are playing to the choir. Hell, you can get a minute repeater from Crator with spring drive technology. There is no ceiling. It has no limit. And then NS something saying, Crador has the H2 with porcelain dial, such an amazing example. And then Juan almost, maybe a little bit, say, a little bit of a counterweight saying, Grand Seiko is way overvalued, not for me. We welcome all opinions. All opinions are valued. And then we've got Henry Jekyll saying, Hi Tim, I love your show. I credit you with my purchase of the JLC Master Compressor Extreme Lab 2. Very cool, man. I do love that watch and wear it almost every day. That is probably the most impressive watch that JLC has ever made for sports watch fans. And I've often said, if it said Richard Mule on the dial, it would cost deep into six, maybe seven figures, and it would have been made by APRP. Uh, I will also say this, Henry, if you ever find the Master Compressor Extreme Lab 1, run, don't walk to secure that thing. That is a monster and a white whale, a unicorn among high horology pieces. Three to five made per year from what I'm told. All right, jumping back into our regularly scheduled program. On deck, it's Tegament. In the house here, Tegmented Steel by Zinn. Introduced on the 756 Duo Chronograph back in 2003, back when the watch industry was just about to fall in love with ceramic watches, Zinn had a better idea. The folks from Frankfurt realizing that ceramic shatters, and that's a big deal on a high-impact sports watch. What did they do? carburized steel, essentially carbon diffusion into the steel to create 1200 Vicar surface hardness, but it also penetrates into the case, although it does soften as it gets closer to the core of the metal, because it does have hard layers underneath the surface, you don't get the eggshell effect that you get when, for example, DLC is applied to 316 steel. So you get this surfacing that has a depth effect that thins out as it gets deeper, so it's harder to dent as well as scratch. This is awesome, and I can tell you, having worn my EZM 1.1 since 2018 and done nothing to baby it, by the way, that's the U1 full tegament, full tegament bracelet, if you're wondering, this EZM 1.1 has hit doorknobs, door frames, car seatbelt buckles, it's come in contact with glass doors, it's knocked into all manner of hardwoods and sheetrock walls. There is not a scratch on the watch. Every other watch material I've owned, steel, titanium, any kind of gold, platinum, would be badly gouged, scratched, and scuffed. So the fellow who asked me about scratching Rolex early on, if you hate watches that scratch, this is the solution. One of the tegmented zins. Get it with the Diapal escapement that needs service only five to 10 years, and you'll also get a five-year warranty and an unlubricated escapement. That's the, that's the ticket. Get the tegmented Zinn with the Diapol escapement. I'm going to just combine those two technologies in this segment and say those are both worthwhile, and you can get them both in the 756 Duo Chronograph. Now, jumping into the box right here, comment from Lee V. Oh, he was asking me about Rolex. Asking, Tim, do you, new, do you like the newest Rolex date with the new movements. Um, yeah, yeah, I have no objections to the implementation of the date. You had another question that I lost because this box is moving fast. Okay, Lee asks, what do you think of the Rolex date just 116234 or the newer 126234? So you're asking me about a date just that uses white Rolosaur with a combination of steel and white gold. I, I like them. I, I gotta be honest, if I were looking for a steel and white gold date just, I would be looking for a 116264. The steel and white gold turnograph, and that would be my choice with either a blue or a black dial if I couldn't find the yellow gold and stainless steel, admittedly, Japan Special Edition. But but I would say probably the 116264 with a blue dial would be my choice. If you're thinking about buying a new Rolex or the old Rolex, just ask which price is better. Because at the end of the day, whether it's a 70-hour power reserve or 48, if you wear it every day, you're not going to notice the difference, and visually the watch is almost indistinguishable. Question from Mark M. Has Moser been discussed yet. No, not yet. Tom the Fish, a counterweight to my opinion, saying GS is overrated in my opinion. And then Long Mac saying, asking Tim, do you think that the Rolex Sky Dweller is a true annual calendar? I, I think the source of this doubt is the fact that it has a date and a month indicator rather than a more complex calendar. Yeah, it's an annual calendar. If you know how to read it, it'll give you the month and the date 
you need adjusted only once per year during the jump from February to March. That means one annual adjustment. It is an annual calendar. Uh, that said, I can understand some folks who want a more intuitive Patek Philippe style day date month indicator for their annual calendar watch. Although I've got to say, if you've got a problem with the way Rolex does it on the Sky Dweller, stay away from Ox und Junior. Almost too minimalist. Jumping right in, we've got Dustin Van Patten saying, Kirazuri dials and spring drive. Big fan. Okay, jumping back to our useful technologies, I should say that Zinn, Tegament, it works. If you hate scratches, get Tegament. Also consider Damasco ice hardening. Or if you've got a big budget and you want to buy a house-priced watch, think about getting the regulator from Chronometry Fernand Bertou, the 1R6, carburized steel, also known as Tegament. Rolex, Paracrom Blue Hair Springs, Niobium Zirconium that has been oxidized blue, a non-ferrous hairspring. Wait, I can hear the question already. Doesn't Rolex also offer a silicon hairspring already. Don't other brands also offer silicon hairsprings? Tim, why are you picking this bridge technology over pure silicon? This is all true, but it's not the solution collectors or watchmakers should seek for the long term. That's my position on silicon. If you saw my Philippe Dufour interview, you saw his position and his gesture regarding what he thinks of silicon. If you haven't seen that, Open up a different window, queue up the Philippe Dufour interview from Dubai Watch Week. Paracrom appeals to me as a collector, and possibly to you, because it is serviceable, repairable, and almost amagnetic. That is to say, it is remarkably amagnetic. Um, in almost any encounter you will have in daily life. Whether you work near a particle accelerator, high-powered home and office equipment, the only limit, and I haven't tested it yet, might be an MRI, but I'm going to test it, and I'm gonna test it with a Milgauss. Parachrom can be repaired. That overcoil hairspring is still made by hand at Rolex. The curve is formed manually, and if it should ever be deformed in the future due to shock or rough handling, a watchmaker can fix it. A silicon hairspring is an industrial product that does not offer meaningfully more anti-magnetic quality, but it cannot be fixed. So if for whatever reason, think about trying to get electronic parts for cars from the 90s, if those parts are no longer made and you can't find new old stock, your watch becomes a paperweight just like your 1997 Lincoln Mark VIII becomes a paperweight. All of which is to say, Parachrom appeals to traditional watchmakers and collectors. And IWC tested this tech with the 1989 to 1992 Ingenieur 3508, the 500,000 ampere per meter. That was a minimum, not a maximum. With the same material that Rolex uses on its Parachrom blue hairsprings, IWC was able to advertise the first truly amagnetic watch. And at the end of the day, I would say the Milgauss and every other Rolex watch, because of the presence of the Parachrom hairspring, is probably at least an order of magnitude more anti-magnetic than the, the ISO 764 that defines an anti-magnetic watch. I would also say the Milgauss is probably several Milgauss, given what I know about that alloy. And like I said, I am eventually gonna test this in non-destructive and non-dangerous and non-illicit form with an MRI. Jumping into the box right there, we got a question. Joe R. asking, Zinn or Fortis? I'm gonna say Zinn because in general, Zinn has more proprietary technologies that I feel add interest and, and value for the collector. The prices of both brands are honest, but I feel that Zinn, especially with the direct sale, as they still sell factory direct, is probably giving you more for your money. Also, some of the more interesting Fortis complications are ungodly thick. But I will say, if you want the original Paul Gerber designed, B42 Alarm Chronograph, a very cool option. You can even get it with a chronometer certification and a GMT, which makes it absolutely stacked. And the few and exquisite Fortis jump hours and art pieces are wonderful watches to own. But again, those are the minority. In general, Zinn versus Fortis, I think you get more for your money with Zinn, especially with technologies like Tegament, um, the AR dehumidification, and Diapol, especially with the warranty that comes with Diapol. Jumping back into the box, a few more comments. We got a Monk 93 joining from Lincoln, Nebraska, which you'll recall was devastated in the Plague of Frogs story arc. And if you know your Hellboy comics, that makes sense. Jumping right, take that, Kathahem. 
burned to cinders. All right, jumping into the box one more time. We got a question by Emily N. Rolex versus Omega. Well, we've only got one lifetime to discuss and one show in which to discuss it. I'm not sure this can be tackled. Overall, I prefer Omega. Why? Because a used watch costs less, which is how the world is supposed to work. You can buy a new watch without a weight. The vintage catalog is just as imposing and desirable, and in fact, you have options for which Rolex has no alternative, like the alarm watches, for example. And I would also say funky and period evocative styles like the Seamaster Bullhead chronographs. In the modern era, I also feel like Omega is a little bit more adventurous, and if you want a high horology watch from your mainstream brand, you've got all sorts of craft pieces from the revived 321 caliber in the platinum case to the tourbillon watches to the skeleton watches that come along every once in a blue moon. So Omega as a brand, to me, past and present, top to bottom, new and pre-owned is just a more expansive universe. Again, it's like the Hellboy universe. It's Lobster Johnson. It's Hellboy. It's BPRD. It's all of this, all in one. And you can stay under the Omega banner. Jumping right into the box, Simon M. What do you think of the GMT Master 2 116710LN? I, I think in particular, the black bezel has become a collectible watch, and people are paying more for them now than they were a year ago before that watch disappeared. So I would say, yeah, investment-wise, it's got potential, but we're also in a general steel Rolex bubble that I feel is going to deflate a little bit during the next recession. So if you can wait, do so. And I would also say, no watch is ultimately worth paying a huge premium over retail. I do think prices will come back down to earth. As attractive as the watch is, if you're looking at it as an investment, look at it as a 20-year investment rather than a 20-month investment. Okay, now... One more impressive technology from Breguet. We have the magnetic pivots for the balance of the Breguet Classique chronometry. I've sung its praises before, but this is incredible. Ultra high powered magnets inside a watch. What does it do? It improves shock protection, it decreases friction. Both of those improving the performance of your watch on the wrist, which is why Breguet from the factory promises minus one plus three seconds per day, which is far beyond the COSC's minus four plus six. I'll also also say that uh, because this floating balance inside the movement is integrated with a great deal of traditional high horology finishing, I can live or at least coexist with the idea of non-serviceable silicon inside the watch because Breguet doesn't cheat you of the anglage, the Cote de Genève, the engraving, the craft arts, the black polished screws with the chamfered slots. All of that is in there and these magnets are only possible in proximity to silicon escapement and hairspring components. So all of it is justified in the interests of performance without sacrificing that high horology craftsman's touch. Weaknesses? Well, I think it's probably worth mentioning that some of the weaknesses here include that it can probably only function in a full silicon environment. So brands that don't have that are not going to be able to employ this tactic, patents aside. I'll also mention that I still don't love the presence of silicon in the watch, so I have serviceability questions. It'll still be beautiful in 50 years, but will it be repairable? And then I would also mention that there is another 72,000 vibration per hour Breguet, the 3880 or the Type 20 two pilots watch. It has the same silicon escapement and high beat technology. It does not have the magnetic balance pivots, which leads me to wonder whether this system is rugged enough to use in a sports watch, and I strongly suspect not. So on that basis, very cool and one of the best values in a used dress watch. Okay, another huge innovation that opened my eyes because I was underwhelmed by the first minute repeaters I encountered until I encountered JLC's welded gong system. Welding the gong of the repeater to the sapphire of the watch, if you can go full screen right there, guys, you can see that down at about five o'clock on the dial, there's a little plaque with some musical notes. Well, that is where the repeater gong is welded to the sapphire. The sapphire welded gong is the least dense part of the case. So by grafting the gong to the least dense part of the case and the best conductor, JLC found a way to bypass the deadening influence of the case material. The result was platinum minute repeaters that rang like titanium and titanium minute repeaters loud enough to impress Motorhead live. 
All right, jumping into the box right here. I see MBD saying, I love the 7727, but Tim, I thought you said recently this tech was a dead end. It is. There have been many dead ends in watchmaking. 36,000 vibration per hour chronographs are one of them, and yet we still love the El Primero. So while the 7727 is a dead end technology, the performance is there. It's very cool. A GPHG 2014 Aguidor winner, so a grand prize laureate, as well as one of the coolest little I would guess baubles to impress your friends who are not otherwise into watches because it includes a 10 hertz spinner on the dial. All right, watch tech that didn't make the cut, and here's why. Tag Heuer's carbon fiber hairspring. Cool in principle, anti-magnetic, proprietary tech. Tag Heuer now makes its own hairspring, and of course, thermally resistant. Why not? One of my leading tech recommendations, because it's not scalable. We all thought the Otavia Isograph was going to land this year at a wonderful entry-level price, giving us this technology for the masses. Doesn't look like it's going to happen. The Isograph may never come out as an Otavia with a carbon fiber hairspring, which means that you're only likely to see it in high-end watches, and that wasn't the idea. So it's not scalable, and it might be fragile. I'll also mention that it's unserviceable, the same as silicon. If it breaks, it's broke. There is no shaping it back into form if it gets distended. Omega, the coaxial escapement, technically impressive and still probably the most impressive escapement you can buy for under 50 grand, but not clearly superior given the complexity it introduces. I've seen well-regulated ETA 28242s in TISOs win chronometry awards, and I've seen them keep time as good as any coax omega. All of which is to say a very basic watch can be regulated by a good watchmaker to keep the same time as the coax. And I've seen Rolex's Chronergy escapement, which is a modified Swiss lever, keep the same time as the best of the Omega coaxes. Not saying it doesn't work, just saying there are other ways to get there, and it doesn't involve this complexity and cost. And finally, the Zenith Defy Inventor, the caliber ZO342, a machine made by a machine, and we know how that story ends. This is a un this is a monoblock silicon oscillator that is the balance, the hairspring, and the escapement all in one. There is very little traditional watchmaking here and very little even Philippe Dufour can do to help you if the darn thing breaks. This is disposable tech with a luxury price. And if you find this Zenith mechanism as emotionally engaging as a hand-assembled Swiss lever, then one of these might be your next dog. That's about as warm and fuzzy as silicon. And in fact, that's silicon by other means. Jumping into your Questions and comments. We got Long Mac asking, Tim, what watch gives you the most complications for $20,000? Probably still the Zenith Pilot Double Matic, and that's for under 10 grand. But above that level, you've got a lot of options. You've got options that include Torbion. You can get a Torbion for under 20 grand. Uh, Arnold and Son UTTE. Or you can, you know, go haul hog and buy something like a uh, Blancpain GMT Revi, which is 100 meters water resistant, loomed, it has a power reserve, it has an on-off function, it has a GMT, it has a, an alarm, high horology finish, and the alarm is able to wind itself, which is something you very rarely see. You might be able to find a yellow gold Glasuta Original Pano Retrograph for $20,000, and, and that would probably be the cap of what you can get for 20,000 bucks. That is a countdown timer flyback chronograph with a countdown alarm built in. And of course, that's without discussing the many multifunction quartz watches from Omega and Breitling that reset our standards for multifunction complication under $20,000. That's a different realm of discussion. Now, your viewer wrist shots. As I like to say, your pieces, my pixels. Viewer wrist shots, ALK presents a loom shot of his JLC-powered Panerai Rodimir PAM198 day with Horween leather strap. Pete W. looms with his Tudor Black Bay from the County of Kent, United Kingdom, very nicely composed. That is his Tudor Black Bay GMT, I should mention. Abdul R. captures his full contemporary collection with this loom shot from the Black Forest in Germany. And Craig E. hails from Switzerland in Zermatt, with the local Swatch edition and the Matterhorn framed upper left behind. Very cool, guys. Send those wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. And remember, Team Osso at thewatchbox.com is the question 
email line from you to me and my handpicked crew for your pricing and purchase questions about the watches you see on our site or our watch review channel. Comment and subscribe, and as ever, join Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. Open another window. Follow me now. Guys, thank you so much. Time out, Tim out. Thanks to the best crew in the business and the best audience. This is the sign-off for our old set. New horizons, new conquests beckon. And I will see you there. Time out, Tim out. Thanks for logging on. Bye.